Right, hello everybody. Um, thank you for turning up. I'm afraid I can't see you. I can only see my slides because I'm doing this through my phone, alas, but I will see you in person when my slides are finished. Uh, the lot of women in the 19th century. So <clears throat> there we have our lovely Queen Vic. On the 20th of June 1837, at the age of 18, Victoria ascended the throne as Queen of the British Empire. Her uncle, King William IV, had died the night before, leaving no legitimate heirs. And with her own father having passed away when she was less than two years old, Victoria was next in line. Her guide and mentor was the Prime Minister, Lord Melbourne, to whom she remained close for the rest of her life. The Queen was diminutive in stature, only five feet tall. And for those who, of you who have met me, that's my height. But her temper was ferocious, a little bit like mine, and her will made of iron. I think it's something about us short people. She had received a rigorous private education at Kensington in preparation for her role, and her ministers in Parliament very soon came to highly respect her judgment and her commitment to the realm of Great Britain. In 1867, she was also granted the title Empress of India. Although she never traveled to the subcontinent, she was fascinated by the language, culture, and food, and became fluent in Hindi, both written and spoken. When she died on the 22nd of January 1901, she had ruled for 63 years and seven months, longer than any of her predecessors. She oversaw a period of great industrial, cultural, political, scientific and military change within the UK, along with a massive expansion of the British Empire. Victoria married her cousin, Prince Albert of Saxe-Coburg-Gotha, and Saxe-Coburg-Gotha, I should say, sorry, on the 10th of February 1840, the Chapel Royal at St. James's Palace, London. Like her, he was extremely well educated, and like her, he had witnessed the profligacy and debauchery of the senior members of his family. They were utterly devoted to each other. They resolved to present themselves as a role model family to the people of Great Britain, and indeed went on to have nine children. Each of the five daughters and four sons married into European royalty, creating a powerful dynasty which produced not just future rulers of Great Britain, but also of Germany and Russia. So far, so much common knowledge. But it is a fallacy that Victoria was a prude. She enjoyed her sex life with Albert very much, though she loathed childbirth and was the first person to publicly condone the use of ether to relieve labor pains. She and Albert often gave each other birthday and Christmas presents of risque art, statues as well as paintings. The young Victoria commissioned a painting of herself for Alfred's private viewing that was extremely alluring and suggestive. It's actually hung in Osborne House on the Isle of Wight. Uh, if Martin was here, he'd be able to elaborate on that, I'm sure. Victoria was not responsible for the sexual double standard that prevailed throughout the 19th century. It happened to coexist with her reign. A good book on this subject for anybody who might be interested is Stephen Marcus, The Other Victorians. And my golly, it's an eye opener. So we're on to the first of our women, the angel in the house. The angel in the house, 1854, is the title of a famous poem by Coventry Patmore about marital love and chastity. In it, Patmore reverenced the love contained within the home with the combination of moral earnestness, romantic enthusiasm, capital R, romantic, and chivalric codes. It provided an image of home sweet home and was promoted by both Charles Dickens and John Ruskin. Dickens's novels often feature the angelic young wife who makes her home a sanctuary for the husband whom she is devoted to. And Ruskin believed that woman was made to be the helpmeet of man. In his lecture, Sesame and Lilies of 1865, he went so far as to say that throughout Shakespeare's entire oeuvre, there is only one weak woman 
of Philia, and it is because she fails Hamlet at the critical moment and is not and cannot in her nature be a guide to him when he needs her most. Well then, it is after this, says Ruskin, that the bitter catastrophe occurs. Ruskin wrote famously that woman must be enduringly, incorruptibly good, instinctively, infallibly wise, wise not for self-development, but for self-renunciation. Famously, he wrote that while man was the doer, creator, discoverer, defender, woman's intellect is for sweet ordering, arrangement and decision. Her great function is praise. This was the social notion of separate spheres. While man faces the public world, woman must remain in the private world of the home. Conduct manuals were written for women on how to behave appropriately and how best to serve as a wife and mother. And these weren't all written by men. Among the biggest sellers were the series written by Sarah Stickney Ellis, on Daughters of England, Wives of England, and Mothers of England. I'm sure there were other things of England. They're the three most famous ones. Ellis, along with many other upper middle class women, were horrified at the thought of female emancipation. It is also interesting to note the irony behind the tenets put forth by Dickens and Ruskin when we consider that Dickens was an exceptionally cruel man to both his wife and his children, and Ruskins virtually gave his young wife Effie to the painter Millet, the mature female body revolted him, and he ended up marrying his extremely young cousin Rose Latouche. The Lady with the Lamp when reports reached Britain of the horrific conditions suffered by wounded soldiers during the Crimean War, which was 53 to 56, <clears throat> Florence Nightingale and a team of 38 volunteer nurses set sail for the Ottoman Empire, present day Turkey, on the 21st of October, 1854. She insisted on the building of ventilated hospital huts in order for the combatants to be treated away from the battlefield, along with the implementation of strict hygiene and sanitary measures. Mind-blowing stuff back then. Before her arrival, 10 times more soldiers died from diseases such as cholera, typhoid and dysentery than those who actually fell in battle. After her interventions, the death rate of those wounded during conflict is estimated to have reduced from 42% to 2%. Nightingale was also a strong advocate of bedside care, making sure that every soldier was personally attended to at regular intervals by a member of her nursing staff who provided succor to the men as individuals rather than simply as patients to be patched up and sent back out onto the battlefield. The popular image of Nightingale was an exact fit for the angel in the house, although she was known as the Lady with the Lamp. There were music hall songs sung about her, poems written about her, and of course many paintings romanticising her. As you can see here, this one is by Henrietta Ray, done in the 1890s, extremely romanticized image. Here's Florence wearing white, very angelic, covering herself up extremely modestly because she is there to care for others, not to showcase herself. And the gratitude can quite clearly be seen on the soldier's face there. There were music hall songs and paintings and poems, but there was much more to her than this, or the picture of her in later years as an invalid confined to the couch. Apart from her pioneering work in nursing, Nightingale reformed healthcare for all sections of British society. She advocated better hunger relief in India, helping to abolish prostitution laws, and expanding the acceptable forms of female participation in the workplace. <clears throat> 
She was also a prodigious and versatile writer. She specifically wrote tracts in language easily accessible to poorer and less well-educated sectors of society. She was a pioneer in data visualization using infographics and statistics. And she wrote extensively on religion and mysticism. She also published a book called Cassandra in 1852, which was a protest against the over feminization of women into near helplessness, such as the angel in the house. So this is what Nightingale saw in her mother's and older sister's lethargic lifestyle, despite their education. She rejected their life of thoughtless comfort for the world of social service. And Lytton Strachey, the notorious debunker of 19th century heroes, devotes an entire chapter of his eminent Victorians of 1918 to praising Nightingale's work and made her a national icon for feminists of the 1920s and 1930s. And Michael, in a future lecture, will speak about eminent Victorians. The great social evil, prostitution. The starvation wages of women at the lowest economic level, the maintenance of the armed forces, and the social ambition which required the postponement of marriage until a young man could afford to live like a gentleman were all major factors in the rise of prostitution during the 19th century. By 1850, there were at least 50,000 prostitutes known to police in England and Scotland, 8,000 of which walked the streets of London alone. The social commentator Ippolite Tain remarked that every hundred steps one jostles 20 harlots and he called prostitution the real plague spot of English society. In 1885 W.T. Stead exposed the extent of child prostitution in the Pall Mall Gazette in his series of articles called The Maiden Tribute of Modern Babylon. He set out to procure a young girl, in inverted commas, in order to demonstrate the horrific ease with which it could be done, not only to shame the men who participated in such a practice, but also the mothers who gladly sold their young daughters into the trade in order to have one less mouth to feed. Shocking, but alas, true. F.W. Newman wrote a tract begging young men to practice abstinence, for he believed that then the pernicious trade of the harlot would cease to exist. However, it was the activist Josephine Butler who made the greatest impact on social reforms with regards to prostitution laws. Butler was an English feminist and social reformer in the Victorian era, she campaigned for women's suffrage, the right of women to a better education, the end of coverture in British law, under which man owns everything, <clears throat> and the abolition of child prostitution and an end to human trafficking of young women and children into European prostitution. Butler was also instrumental in the repeal of the Contagious Diseases Act. The acts had been introduced in 1864, 66 and 69 to regulate prostitution in an attempt to control the spread of venereal diseases, particularly in the British Army and Royal Navy. They authorised the police to detain women in specific areas which were considered to be <coughs> frequented by prostitutes. No evidence was needed other than the police officer's word. If a magistrate agreed, the women were then given genital examinations. If women were suffering from sexually transmitted diseases, they were held in a lock hospital until the condition was cured. If they refused to be examined or hospitalized, then they were imprisoned, often with hard labor. All of this on the hearsay of a police officer. 
Butler formed a league and published the Ladies' Manifesto, in which she claimed that the acts not only deprived poor women of their constitutional rights and forced them to submit to a degrading internal examination, but they officially sanctioned a double standard of sexual morality, which justified male sexual access to a class of fallen women and penalised women from engaging in the same vice as men. She toured Britain holding meetings, collecting signatures, including those of Harriet Martineau and Florence Nightingale. She was chased through the streets by furious brothel owners and protesters, both male and female, would cover the floors of her meeting spaces with cayenne pepper. But undeterred, she eventually split Parliament with her dogged devotion to her cause, setting up homes for the rehabilitation of prostitutes and enlisting MPs in support. In 1886, the Contagious Diseases Act were finally repealed. The Kept Woman and the Fallen Woman it was the sexual double standard alluded to by Josephine Butler that created the phenomenon of what the Victorians called the fallen woman. A recurrent theme in novels such as George Eliot's Adam Bede and Elizabeth Gaskell's Ruth was the seduction of lower class and lower middle class girls by gentlemen of material means for whom such incidents were often simply considered a fling. In 1857, Dr. William Acton pronounced that seduction is a sport and a habit with vast numbers of men married and signal, single, men who are placed above the ranks of labor. In 1851, 42,000 illegitimate children were born in England and Wales. And on that basis, Acton, estimated that one in 12 of the unmarried females in the country above the age of puberty have strayed from the path of virtue, lured by false promises of love and marriage by men who actually had nothing of the sort in their plans, or men who began with good intentions and then discovered that factors such as family expectations and social prejudices meant that such promises were impossible to carry out after all, impressionable and naive young women were seduced and abandoned and thus made outcasts by the Victorian code of moral purity. Such hypocritical codes split families, usually of the middle and upper middle classes, for whom reputation was the bedrock of existence. The young woman was often ostracized, left to fend for herself, often committing suicide, so that neither she nor her unborn child would be subject to inevitable shame. Many artists and authors used their work as a vehicle through which to protest such societal iniquities. George Frederick Watts famously depicted such a victim in extremely sympathetic terms in his 1850 painting, Found Drowned. It depicts the dead body of a woman washed up beneath the arch of Waterloo Bridge, taking as its inspiration the 1844 poem by Thomas Hood called The Bridge of Sighs. In the painting, the young lady's arms are outstretched, emulating the pose of Jesus on the cross, signifying that she, too, has been sacrificed for the sins of others. Christina Rossetti, sister of the pre-Raphaelite painter Dante Gabriel, wrote a poem called The Daughter of Eve in 1865, the title and text of which allude to the plight of the fallen woman. I read this out aloud to my students, 15 and 16 years old, and it's not until they hear it spoken that they are truly horrified by its meaning. A fool I was to sleep at noon and wake when night is chilly beneath the comfortless cold moon. A fool to snap my lily. My garden plot I have not kept, faded and all forsaken. I weep as I have never wept. Oh, it was summer when I slept. It's winter now I waken. Talk what you please of future spring and sun-warmed sweet tomorrow. 
stripped bare of hope and everything. No more to laugh, no more to sing. I sit alone with sorrow. Short and direct, her readership will have had no illusions as to what the poem was about. And the fact that it was written by a relatively wealthy and respectable woman was in itself scandalous. <clears throat> However, the obverse of this was the notion of the kept woman, a young lady who willingly complied with being a mistress, supplying pleasure and succour to a particular gentleman in return for material comfort and independence. The kept woman resolutely refused the social stigma associated with physical relations outside of marriage, and many were depicted by the members of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. The Kissed Mouth, 1881, by Dante Gabriel Rossetti, and The Awakening Conscience, 1853, by William Holman Hunt, being among the better-known paintings, <clears throat> as Martin will speak about at a later date. And Thomas Hardy, hello, our man, wrote an extremely amusing tongue-in-cheek poem dedicated to the figure called The Ruined Maid, first written in 1866. Strap yourselves in, an Australian living in North Yorkshire is going to attempt to go all West Country. <clears throat> oh, Melia, my dear, this does everything, crown. Oops could have supposed I should meet you in town, and when such fair garments, such prosperity. Oh, didn't you know? I'd been ruined, said she. You left us in tatters without shoes or socks, tired of digging potatoes and spudding up ducks, and now you've gay bracelets and bright feathers three. Yes, that's how we dress when we're ruined, said she. At home in the Barton, you said thee and thou, and thick on and this on and t'other, but now you're talking quite fit stay for high company. Some polish is gained with one's ruin, said she. Your hands were like paws then, your face blowing bleak, but now I'm bewitched by your delicate cheek, and your little gloves fit as on any lady. We never do work when we're ruined, said she. You used to call home life a hag-ridden dream, and you'd sigh and you'd suck, but at present you seem to not know of megrims and melancholy. True, one's pretty lively when ruined, said she. I wish I had feathers, a fine sweeping gown, and a delicate face, and could strut about town. My dear, a raw country girl such as you be, cannot quite expect that. You ain't ruined, said she. The governess. In the upper classes, it was assumed that a girl would marry and that therefore she had no need of a formal education, as long as she could look beautiful, entertain her husband's guests, and produce a reasonable number of children in a reasonable amount of time. Accomplishments such as playing the piano, singing, and flower arranging were what was truly important. If she could not find a husband, she faced a grim future as a maiden aunt, whose help could always be called upon to look after her aged parents or her siblings' children. Upper middle class unmarried women might be forced to take on employment as a governess, an occupation looked down on upon by many as little more than a maid. This prospect became increasingly unattractive to intelligent women, but when Queen's College in London was founded in 1848, young women were able to achieve recognised and marketable qualifications. Ten years later, Cheltenham Ladies College was founded, and other girls' public schools soon followed. The Bronte sisters, particularly Anne and Charlotte, created the most famous depictions of the governess in Victorian literature. And both had indeed been governesses to wealthy Yorkshire families themselves. In Agnes Grey, Anne Bronte describes the unbelievable pressures that the governess's life involved. The isolation, the frustration, the insensitive and sometimes actively cruel treatment on the part of employers and their families. And bear in mind that these employers were of the same social class as 
the governess. More well known, of course, is Jane Eyre of 1847 by Charlotte. Blanche Ingram declares that half of them governesses are detestable and the rest ridiculous and all incubi in front of Jane. And Jane later decries to Rochester, do you think I am an automaton, a machine without feelings? Do you think because I am poor, obscure, plain and little, I am soulless and heartless? You think wrong. I have much soul as you, much full as heart. Of course, both Agnes and Jane find happy endings. Reader, I married him, declares Jane at the end of the latter novel. But this was most definitely not the case for the majority of women forced into the unhappy occupation of governess. The New Woman and the Odd Woman. John Stuart Mill published On Liberty in 1859, and The Subjection of Women, though written in 1861, was not published until 1869. Both treatises, on which Mill collaborated with early feminist Harriet Taylor, whom he married in 1851, promoted and appealed for a doctrine of equality and freedom of thought. Mill never wavered in his belief in the rights of women, and his treatises proved instrumental in a number of causes, such as the Married Women's Property Acts, the repeal of the Contagious Diseases Acts, calls for universal suffrage, and the distribution of Charles Knowlton's pamphlet on birth control, The Fruits of Philosophy, all the way back in 1832. Events like these proved a major influence upon the ideology of the new woman. The term new woman was coined in England in 1894 by Sarah Grand when she published an essay entitled The New Aspect of the Woman Question in the North American Review. Grand used the phrase the new woman to denote the woman who has finally solved the problem and proclaimed for herself what was wrong with home is the woman's sphere and prescribed the remedy. New Woman's Fiction, written by Sarah Grand and George Egerton, who was also obviously a woman, among others highlighted the sexual double standards inherent in a patriarchal society, which placed the blame for diseases like syphilis upon prostitutes instead of the clients who requested their services. The New Woman was an independent woman who sought radical change in society, Marriage was not castigated by her, but she would not consider it without complete equality between both partners. A new woman worked, usually in an office or a shop. She attended lectures on science and art, provided to the general public by the Society for the Diffusion of Useful Knowledge and the popular mechanics institutes around the country. She visited the British Library and the British Museum in order to extend her knowledge, if unable to obtain a place at university. She smoked, she drank, she rode a bicycle and wore trousers, while retaining her distinctly feminine appearance. In contrast to the new woman, the odd woman, as delineated by George Gissing in his novel, The Odd Women, was represented as remaining resolutely aloof from the society of men. Being self-sufficient, living alone or with a female friend, mixing freely in society without an accompanying chaperone, quel horreur. Such women were often the subject of ridicule within literature, being perceived by the male majority as unnatural. Characters such as Gissing's Mary Barfoot or her American counterpart, Mademoiselle Reich, from Kate Chopin's The Awakening in 1899, were portrayed as preferring ostracism if it meant having the freedom to behave as one chose, rather than according to the seemingly suffocating societal conventions of the fin de siècle. Mademoiselle Reich in The Awakening may be read as a character who invites derision with her appalling lack of dress sense and her wish to live in isolation in apartments under the roof of a building in order to discourage the approach of callers, but her character is admirable for despising ignorance and treating her ridiculers with contempt. 
for she is the only character within the novel, according to Kate Chopin, who possesses the soul that dares and defies. And for the conclusion, we have a happy smiling Victoria for all those naysayers out there. In conclusion, it suffices to say that one's lot as a woman during Victoria's reign depended upon a number of circumstances, such as class, societal conventions of gender, religious doctrine, and education. Far from being the prude she is often accused of, Victoria was quite sexually liberal and publicly championed the work of both Florence Nightingale and Josephine Butler. She escaped an exceptionally miserable childhood known as the Kensington system, that could be a whole lecture in itself, and became the ruling figurehead of a large portion of the world. Her female subjects obviously did not have the same opportunities as their monarch due to the lottery of birth, but many did indeed have the power to change society and to represent the powerless. And by the end of Victoria's reign, the woman once became one became, I'm sorry, was largely that which she herself chose to be. Married Women's Property Acts and divorce laws were passed, giving women much greater freedom than they had experienced previously, and gradually women were accepted into universities, though they were not awarded degrees or allowed to vote until the 20th century. But one thing we must remember is that while the plight of a large proportion of women was indeed dreadful. It was often caused by other women as well as men. And by the same token, we must recognize that many men, such as J.S. Mill, were instrumental in proving the lot of women. Thank you. <laughs>